Um, Luca, can you record? I just hit record. We're good. All right. So then, am I good to start? All right. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, welcome everybody to International Affairs and Issues. If you haven't seen a presentation I've done so far, I did a uh, the one back in like the third or fourth day on the introduction to um, limited prep events, including XDEMP and impromptu. And so this will be me doing this one. Um, just so you know, this one will be pretty long. Uh, probably I'll be pulling up to the limit of about an hour, so just bear with me. So first, how do international events play into speech and debate? So for most debate events, pretty much all of them, you're going to have to deal with international issues at some point. If you do parliamentary debate, it's going to happen probably every single tournament you do. At least one or two rounds will include international issues. And then, of course, if you choose to do international extemp, that's entirely international relations. So you need to have a lot of just backup knowledge in order to do that correctly. National extemp also uses it. And pretty much any speech and debate event where you have to include information about like more political and economic issues. Understanding not just the US, but also the rest of the world is really important because the United States is not the only country out there. And if you only know what's going on within the US, you'll look pretty dumb in certain instances and it'll leave you pretty unprepared. And also just knowing what's going on in the world and international issues in general is just a useful skill for life. So. First, before we begin, just if anybody is curious about sources that are good for learning international news, generally I recommend news sources that are not American and uh, that generally have more neutral biases, like Foreign Affairs, The Economist, BBC, all of them are, all of these on this list are very good for learning information. My personal preferences are Foreign Affairs, BBC is good, Al Jazeera, uh, Jacobin. So pretty much any of these are good. Just keep in mind that when you're learning about the rest of the world, sometimes there will be news sources that pretty much every source reports on accurately. And then there's also a bunch of information and topics that will be covered where some sources will just flat out lie. And there will be really like contentious differences between different groups, for example, like Israel and Palestine. Depending on the news source, you're, you can read entirely different stories of the same event. So it is worth keeping in mind when you're reading different news articles about different events in the world, like what the controversy is regarding each topic. So first, US foreign policy. So how does the United States engage with the rest of the world in international issues? The first is that the United States is a member of a variety of different uh, international organizations. So for example, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, World Trade Organization, North Atlantic Treaty Organizations are some that we're members of and have a big part in leading. In addition, there are other ones like the European Union and there are ones for like the South Pacific developments. There's ones for all of the Americas. And so we're parts of these groups and we voice our opinions and concerns depending on what the issue is that each organization tackles. The second is through military interventions and conflicts. So obviously we have the world's largest military by quite a lot and we use it pretty frequently. Uh, for example, probably one of the most famous examples since World War II is the Vietnam War. We fought wars in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan. We've had many conflicts in Grenada. We've funded different military groups across the world and we have, I think it's like 40 or 50 something military bases on other people on other countries land. Uh, the third way is through trade and treaties. So the United States has a variety of trade um, deals and treaties with different countries such as Canada, Mexico, the European Union, we have some of China, we have some there's trade deals we have with pretty much everybody and different companies and different groups exchange services and goods through international trade and it's very important in terms of how we maintain stability. The next is through foreign aid. So the International Monetary, Monetary Fund and the World Bank are some of the international groups that give out aid. I'll talk about that later. But we give out foreign aid to different countries. We give military aid, we give financial aid, we give humanitarian aid. 
Um, the fifth way is through immigration. So obviously a lot of people tend to want to come to the United States because we're the wealthiest country in the world and have some of the best opportunities economically compared to many third world countries that suffer a lot, in part because of us. Um, and then also United States citizens emigrate to other countries too. So immigration is one key way that we take in people who have other opinions. And then the sixth is through culture. So obviously if you've ever watched a Japanese anime, if you've ever had Italian food, if you've ever <clears throat> like taken a trip somewhere, we exchange cultural ideas and cultural norms with different countries. And it's part of, it is part of the way that we engage. I won't talk about it really in this uh, PowerPoint, but it is worth keeping in mind. So first international organizations, I'll go through these pretty quickly. If you want, I'll, I'll post the PowerPoint later so you can look through stuff. I'm not gonna talk about everything because there's a lot, but first there's the United Nations. The top is just a topic that we had at a, one tournament we did last year, just to give you an idea of what topics sometimes you get in speech and debate. Um, so United Nations was an organization that was mainly founded by the United States, France, England, uh, uh, Russia or Soviet Union and China after World War II. And the goal of it was to avoid another global war like uh, like the one against the Nazis in Japan and Italy. Uh, so at the current moment, there are 193 countries involved and two other non-member states, which are um, the Vatican or Holy See and Palestine. And there are a variety of different organizations within the United Nations. Perhaps the two most well-known are the General Assembly and the Security Council. The General Assembly kind of makes the big overall decisions regarding what to do with UN funding and how to deal with certain issues. The Security Council is mainly focused on military action and whether or not to condemn a country for something they did or not. And there's 15 members at a time. There are five permanent ones, the United States, China, Russia, France, and England. And they all have the ability to veto any resolution that comes up. And there's a lot of contention over whether or not there should be permanent members. Well, uh, obviously, as that topic talks about whether there should be a veto power or whether there should even be like three West, like three Western states and just Russia and China there at all. And then there are a variety of other aspects of the United Nations kind of regarding the biggest things regarding international law and how to deal with global issues. So the World Trade Organization is a different organization separately from the UN, and it has 164 groups. And its ultimate goal is kind of to make trade as free as possible and to have as much international trade as possibly can. Uh, there's agreements that they create and they settle disputes between different countries of over whether or not free trade is too free or whether there's unfair circumstances in different countries for certain groups in other areas. A lot of people argue that the U.S. is too involved in the World Trade Organization and exerts too much power and America argues the exact opposite, which pretty much always happens in every single thing the United States does in the world. Um, so yeah. Uh, so two groups, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the International Monetary Fund. Their group, their organizations that are being generally focused on the foreign aid elements and sending out loans to countries that need money. Uh, the IMF makes shorter term loans, uh, the organization's done some good stuff, but there's also a lot of people who argue that the IMF is uh, basically forcing a lot of countries into serious debt by giving them a lot of money when they really just need like more permanent stuff. And they sometimes force countries to give up valuable assets that they have in order to um, like conform to the ideology. And the World Bank also has a lot of controversy over the fact that they set the global poverty threshold at $2 a day, basically, which if you live in the United States, nobody here can live off $2 a day. Um, it's a policy that doesn't really work even in the poorest areas where food is cheaper. Uh, most estimates suggest that it's closer to $7 a day. And many people say the World Bank does this on purpose, mainly because of the United States in order to make countries like in Africa seem like there's way less people who are in extreme poverty and it's a valid argument but the World Bank also is involved with longer term development so they uh, provide investments for infrastructure and for buildings that will produce more economic growth for countries. So NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. 
It's a military alliance, mainly based in the United States, Canada, and Europe, and it was designed to counter the Soviet Union and communism spread after World War II. Um, today, it's now 30 countries, including some that were former Soviet Union, um, ter like, not territories, like um, satellite countries. Uh, and this includes things like Poland, I believe, is a member of it. I think Hungary is too. And it's generally focused less on economics or trade or money, and it's focused on protecting the citizens within the country's alliance. And they respond to cybersecurity, threats about bombing. They try to share information about suspected terrorists. Um, and then in recent years, there's been controversy because Trump thinks that the U.S. pays too much uh, for, of the military supplies for NATO, and they want some of the European countries, like Germany in particular, to pay more. And then there are some, many people in the third world countries often criticize NATO for being less concerned about protecting the North American, North Atlantic Treaty Organization members as opposed to basically just making sure that NATO always gets its way whenever possible. And that sometimes they go into countries in the name of national security when they're actually more interested in extracting resources. But overall, NATO is generally focused on domestic threats from within the countries that are members of the alliance. Uh, the European Union is one the United States is not a member of. It's a European organization that was designed to kind of create a unified Europe after World War II. Um, any con all countries that are a member of the European Union uh, have the same currency, which is the euro. There's open borders between the countries, so you can move in between, and it's very easy to um, immigrate to one country or the other. Uh, the countries within there get better trade deals, and there's no tariffs in between the countries, and they just settle a lot of disputes and have a lot of the same deals between the countries as opposed to having each country make their own deal with like the United States or something. And as we'll talk about later, there is a bunch of information lately about Brexit, which is when the United Kingdom left the EU just at the beginning of this year. And here are some other organizations. Um, pretty much any, every single continent has some organization that kind of represents the entire continent to some degree. There are other groups designed for different, more like focused ideas. There's an international labor group for workers. There are groups for pretty much any targeted thing you can think of. But here's just some of the more well-known ones. So current issues in US diplomacy. Uh, first, we have denuclearization. So Denuclearization is basically the process of having other countries in the United States to reduce their nuclear war arsenal because obviously nuclear war is not ideal for anybody as Hiroshima and Nagasaki kind of proved. Um, so for the ultimate purpose is that the United States wants nuclear weapons to act as a deterrent and to be able to kind of enforce their policies across the world. But as a response to the United States, the Soviet Union, China, North Korea, um, Iran initially, to some degree, Pakistan and India, though that's more for later, different countries have built nuclear weapons in order to kind of serve as a balance to US power and say, hey, you don't, aren't the only ones of nuclear weapons. And the focus of denuclearization is to get rid of as many nuclear weapons as possible. Lately, some of the biggest talks have been around North Korea because Kim Jong-un is very unstable and is not reliable for having nuclear weapons. And the idea is that the United States will reduce their weapons and North Korea will too and other countries will. Another one that's been a target is Israel because Israel's had nuclear weapons and has had a malicious intent for a while. Iran was also, there's a, the Iran nuclear deal, which was a deal signed in 2015 that uh, was involved with reducing Iran's nuclear capacity. And it's still a very contentious topic today over how to deal with all the nuclear weapons. It's um, very important for pretty much every single country and for the United States. One of the biggest things, which I'll talk about later, I think in the next slide, is um, NAFTA and the USMCA, which are trade deals that have been very contentious. Um, so free trade is a very well-adopted initiative. The idea that if you trade as much between other countries, you become more dependent, you're less likely to go to war. Uh, different uh, groups that need different materials can get them easier, goods are cheaper. Um, some people dislike free trade because you can produce some, uh, like some supplies in a country where there's not environmental regulations or not worker protections. And you can exploit workers in the environment there and then ship the goods off to the US. 
Uh, many labor unions in the U.S. oppose free trade um, because when you have free trade, often jobs go to overseas where it's cheaper. But many people argue that free trade is one of the best ways to improve the economy. So free trade is one of those topics that is very difficult to like deal with in the United States because many people agree with the idea, but when it comes to a free trade agreement that could affect jobs in your area, people oppose it. Um, so wars in the Middle East. So uh, 18 years ago, or actually long before that, but 18 years ago, the United States declared war on Af like ISIS and, so not ISIS, Al Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan after 9-11. And because it's the United States, we're really bad at solving the problems. We're still at war with the Afghanistan's rebel groups after 19 years. We've been fighting in Syria for nine. We've been fighting in Yemen for seven or so. Um, the wars against ISIS have actually led to a proliferation of terrorist organizations. We funded Israeli and uh, Saudi Arabian terrorism in the Middle East. We've done a lot of very dangerous things and we're still now fighting wars and many argue that it's time for us to pull out. Many say, no, we haven't done our job. And they're very contentious, especially when talking about when we pull out and what we do about like terrorist threats within those countries. So the US-China showdown regarding trade. So uh, Trump earlier in 2018, I believe, uh, began enacting tariffs on China as kind of a retaliatory, retaliatory threat to what he claimed was Chinese exploitation of free trade and of like decent like negotiations. And as China's became more powerful and has became richer, um, the United States and China slapped massive tariffs on each other on billions of goods. And it led to both the United States and China suffering a lot. I mean, as you can see, U.S. exports of goods decreased by 1.8 billion during the time. And we lost like billions of dollars from the agricultural industry and a variety of other industries. And we really didn't solve much, but there's still a lot of conflicts between the U.S. and China today over who should be kind of the superpower. And I think a different presentation earlier talked about that. So I won't go into it too much. So biggest international issues, America. U.S. immigration. Um, the United States has refugees in cages, kids in cages, parents in cages. We have people in cages, which really isn't that good. And uh, we have a really big problem because the United States has a lot of refugees come to the come to the U.S. in large part because we're one of the main sources of refugee placement in the Americas. When you're walking from South America upwards, the natural place to stop, if not Mexico, is the United States. And so we have thousands of people at the border and uh, Trump has drastically reduced all forms of immigration, including legal, um, to like giving people asylum, refugees. And with the number of refugees in the world actually increasing, it's been a very contentious subject regarding what does the United States do with all the people on the border? Do we accept more? Do we accept less? And one of the policies that Trump enacted has been building the wall, which is, I won't get into, but many people disagree with that. There's also um, deporting people back to their home countries, but when many of them come from places where there's drug cartels running their areas, it's a very dangerous policy. And so Democrats and Republicans generally clash a lot over what to do with the immigrant situation in the United States. All right, NAFTA and the USMCA. So the North American Free Trade Agreement was a policy where Mexico, the US and Canada agreed to eliminate all tariffs on each other's goods or most of them, I believe. Uh, and it was to counter the European Union's policies of free trade between their countries. Um, it led to some good things, but a lot of bad. Mexican farmers suffered a lot. The basically industries where companies could put their like put their services in Mexico, where the labor and environmental regulations are lower, benefited a lot. But the U.S. lost jobs, Canada lost jobs, and a lot of Mexican workers, although they got jobs, they were low-paying jobs where they were exploited and worked really high hours. So many people argued that the NAFTA deal was a disaster. Trump included, Bernie included. A lot of people said it was terrible. Uh, the USMCA was a revision, which was pushed by Democrats and Republicans through. Um, it does some things better than NAFTA. There's more environmental regulation and labor rights, but there's also many complaints that it's really not that much better than NAFTA. 
that it only does a tiny amount of what was needed in order to actually reform the deal. But there is a new clause where if you think that one country is being unfair, you can bring a complaint against it. So it's still an issue over what to do with North American free trade, but there are some issues that have been solved since NAFTA was founded in the 1990s. Um, Venezuela, so, hold on. Venezuela, for a very long time, was a colonial power. They got independence during the Latin American Wars of Independence in the early 1900s, but then they became sort of a military dictatorship until the 1990s, I want to say, yeah, uh, when Hugo Chavez became the leader and Venezuela became a socialist country. Initially, there was a lot of massive economic growth, poverty halved, like infant mortality more than halved, a lot of really good things occurred. But then because Venezuela relied a lot on oil and because the US was kind of concerned about having socialist countries do well, private companies refused to participate in Venezuela and both Chavez and the current president, Nicolas Maduro, really didn't manage the economy as well as they should have. Um, things have reversed. There's massive inflation. There are food shortages. And at the current moment, there's kind of a crisis because Maduro is the president, but another man named Juan Guido um, declared himself. Guido is actually the person on the political cartoon is the wooden uh, battering ram. Guido declared himself the acting president uh, of the people a while ago, and there's contention over who's the correct president. The United States says Guido is. Russia and China say Venezuela is, and there's a lot of crisis over what to do about there. Meanwhile, millions of people are fleeing Venezuela. Cuba. Cuba became a socialist country, uh, much like Venezuela, um, after a revolution, which deposed of a more tyrannical government, and Fidel Castro and Che Guevara were the orchestrate, like the well-known figures. Um, initially, Castro did do a lot of good things. He, the, like the medical fields and Cuba improved dramatically, and Cuba has some of the best doctors in the entire world that go out and help in all sorts of conflicts. They've even volunteered to help with U.S. casualties and like hurricanes on the coast. But uh, Castro was when Che Guevara died, and Castro became kind of the sole leader. He became a lot more of an author authoritarian, and a lot of political rights were stripped from Cuban individuals. And Cuba became more of a militant dictatorship until he died. Um, the United States and Cuba have been pretty horrible relations. The U.S. like invaded Cuba multiple times, tried to make it a part of the United States. And I forget what it was, but I think that the United States and the CIA supported over 600 attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro. And every Latin American country kind of says, hey, let's let Cuba be Cuba again. And the United States has repeatedly said no. And one of the other big issues is that uh, the United States is kind of prison for terrorism and terrorists is in Cuba. It's called Guantanamo Bay and Cuba doesn't want it there. A lot of people will argue we don't need it, but many say we need a prison like Guantanamo Bay because we do. Uh, the Northern Triangle, which is known as Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, uh, they used to be doing a little better, but the United States uh, combined with drug cartels, partially funded by the United States, have kind of led to a crisis within the country and um, drug cartels, drug violence, there are large gangs that have almost as much power as the government militias. The government themselves are very corrupt and a lot of the leaders just pocket money. There's massive poverty, lots of gun deaths. Some of the homicide rates are the highest in the world. These three countries are some of the poorest in the world. I mean, they're around the same level as Yemen and like people in North Korea. So. To give you an idea, there's a lot of people fleeing, and these are where these three countries are where a lot of the refugees coming to the United States are from, uh, and to Canada. So there's a massive crisis over what to do with these countries, and many people say the United States should keep their hands off. Some people say the U.S. should economically aid them, but it's sort of a like an internal conflict that they have to resolve. Brazil used to be a socialist country, and then after economic problems, it turned the exact opposite direction. And Nair Bolsonaro was basically a Trump-like populist right leader. Um, he supported a lot of things that many humanitarian groups don't support. I mean, as you can see from the picture, the Am Amazon rainforest has lost millions of acres because of Bolsonaro and also previous leaders. 
And there's a lot of complaints that the Amazon rainforest is literally going to disappear because of corporate interests. Um, indigenous people who live in the Amazon and in other areas have lost a lot of their land, have been forced into sort of reservation type areas or have just been flat out killed. Um, in addition, Brazil has some of the most relaxed drug laws or gun laws in the world. And a lot combined with a large presence of gang violence and drug cartels, it has homicide rates that are higher than that of the United States and many of these other countries. There's a massive wealth inequality and now because COVID is threatening Brazil so much, Bolsonaro's government is actually in threat of being taken over by the military, which is a real possibility since Bolsonaro is basically ignoring everything about COVID and is saying that it's a hoax, sort of like Trump. All right, now we get on to Europe. This is a little shorter. Uh, Brexit. So Brexit was the United Kingdom in 2020. Uh, they separated from the EU after a vote in 2018, I want to say. Um, it was kind of uh, spurred by this movement that the, the UK should have more national sovereignty and that they pay too much and that they give too much to the EU. It was actually initially pretty much, it was like a 67% support for staying initially. But once the Syrian refugee crisis kind of picked up, a lot of people thought that there were too many refugees coming to Britain and that the EU was forcing them to accept too many people. Um, so a combination of kind of... Uh, xenophobic fears combined with like literally flat out lies that the EU, that the leave campaign used combined with just a bunch of people kind of rejecting sort of this liberal notion of acceptance and like international cooperation people decided to leave and now there are conflicts with the eu over what to do with trade and tariffs uh, there's threats of scotland declaring independence from britain northern ireland too um, the border with Northern Ireland and Ireland is another conflict because there were massive um, like guerrilla warfare events that happened in the late 90s or late 1900s with Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, and then Boris Johnson himself, which has kind of been a disaster for the UK so far, especially of him also like Trump and Bolsonaro denying COVID for a long time. And there's a lot of conflict over what Britain should be doing with the EU and how trade deals and all this other stuff should work out because at the moment there's no trade deals and no there's a no deal brexit right now russian imperialism so putin i don't think is a communist at least i can't sell tell for sure he's definitely not a socialist or any regards but he is kind of fond of how much land the ussr originally had and he's fought to take back a lot of the land that was initially there in the satellite power um, he's taken over Crimea. He's taken over a small little state called Georgia. He's funded government um, independence movements or like Russian independence movements in nearby countries like the Ukraine, for example. Um, Ukraine has a very large Russian speaking population and a large Russian favorable movement. And Putin's funded movements to secede Eastern Ukraine to Russia. And combined with that, Putin has killed dozens of political like opponents. He's restricted rights of minorities, LGBTQ people, women's rights, all sorts of things. And Russia itself is kind of a disaster, uh, combined with the fact that they're funding terrorist and uh, authoritarian regimes across the world. Here are just a couple other countries that have really, really terrible leaders who are authoritarian and taking away rights from everybody. Middle East. So... U.S. foreign intervention. As I already talked about this, um, the former imperialist countries gave, said, we're no longer going to get involved in the Middle East. They left and then they came back immediately because all the oil was there and they didn't really want to leave in the first place. Um, in 1953, the United States um, CIA overthrew a democratically elected leader in Iran and installed a military dictatorship because they wanted oil. Um, Britain has been involved in destabilizing Egypt at times. There's been a lot of problems with um, funding Saudi Arabia, funding Israel, funding um, Pakistan and India, all sorts of problems with like, how to like, accu accurately deal with the Middle East. And because the United States and Britain don't really have the best interest of Middle Eastern people at heart, um, bad things have happened. For example, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, the group that caused 9-11, were literally trained by the United States in the 1980s to fight the Soviet Afghanistan leaders. And 
countries all over from all sides of the spectrum, from the United States and Britain to Russia to China to India, have funded various groups within the Middle East, kind of leading to more instability and more crises. Syria is probably one of the most well-known crises within the Middle East right now. It happened during the um, Arab Spring of 2011 when a bunch of countries kind of rejected their authoritarian leaders. In this case, it was Bashar al-Assad. Um, it began, the war began after peaceful protesters were killed by police. And it was initially a war of the rebels versus the government and then uh, Kurdish nationalists, like ethnic minority group in northeast um, Syria kind of fought um, Assad, but they wanted an independent Kurdish state composed of Syria, a little bit of Afghanistan, a little bit of Turkey. And then the rebels split into two groups, kind of the anti-Assad group and ISIS, which is a more um, Islamic extremist group. Uh, the United States was initially focused on actually taking down um, al-Assad's government, and they funded the Kurds and the rebels. But then they um, shifted entirely to ISIS, especially after ISIS um, claimed responsibility for terrorist attacks in Paris and the UK and stuff. And we helped fund the Kurds to help get rid of um, ISIS. We funded the rebels, and then we actually ended up funding um, Assad a little bit. No, sorry, we didn't do that. That was Russia. Um, uh, but um, Turkey has had a lot of issues. Turkey has invaded the Kurds at multiple times, even though they claim to not support Assad. Iran and Russia have supported Assad multiple times, and Assad has used chemical weapons against civilians. He's violated human humanitarian rights. The United States has done that too with some of the bombings that they've had, but Assad is considerably worse. Um, there's been 5.6 million people who have fled. There are now four separate groups fighting, and the United States and different countries are now complicating the matters because Assad is taking advantage of the fight against ISIS to attack the other groups. And it's one of, it's a really big mess and not quite as big as Yemen. Um, Yemen was also a rebel, um, um, <clears throat> was also a rebellion started out of the Arab, Arab Spring. Um, uh, they rebelled against the president. They put in a new president. The new president was good for a while for the Shia group, the Houthis, until the Shia killed the new president, and then the old president claimed that he was the real president. So generally, it's a um, it's an attack between the Houthis, which are kind of the independence rebel group, and the government. Um, Saudi Arabia, after realizing the Houthis were funded by Iran, began bombing Yemen and funding the government. And they've bombed military, they've bombed hospitals, they've bombed funerals, they've bombed pretty much everything that's not military zones at some point or another. The United States has also given Saudi Arabia money because the United States is very anti-Iran at the moment. Um, and then Iran's gotten help from Russia at times and China, and including influence in funding the Houthis, Iraq as well. And now humanitarian groups are saying that literally everybody who's fighting has violated international law, has been bombing civilians, and groups like Saudi Arabia and the United States are seem to be less in it to stop Iran as opposed to try to get all the oil in Yemen, which of which there's a lot. And since then, uh, 100,000 people have died, 3.6 million have fled, 50% of the population is likely to get COVID, 3.3 million children and pregnant mo mothers are suffering from malnutrition, 17 million people are at risk of starvation, Saudi Arabia has bombed everything, and the United States has literally funded a war that's caused one of the worst famines in the entire world. Iran too, Saudi Arabia too. I shouldn't just blame the United States, but pretty much every group has done terrible things. And Yemen, is, it's a really sad disaster. Moving on, Israel and Palestine. So I'll try to keep this as uncontentious as possible. Basically, it's all Britain's fault. Um, in the early 1900s, Palestine was kind of an ethnic diverse area and there are Jewish people, there were Christian people, there were Muslims, there were Hindus, there's actually pretty much group people of every group. It was Muslim majority, but it was a very accepting kind of area. But then there was a movement spawned by some Western European Jews for a Zionist movement to create a Jewish state, basically founded around Jerusalem. And uh, after World War I, the United Kingdom said, yeah, I think we can do that. And after World War II, they said, well, after the Holocaust, we really can't deny you that. So um, it was founded within um, Palestine. And if you've ever seen pictures, hold, uh, actually, I'm not going to look for it. But basically, if you look up the map of the original thing, 
there's no way it was going to work. Like Israel was like three separate areas within Palestine and the Arab, Arab states really didn't like the fact that they basically created a Jewish nation out of former Muslim areas. So um, pretty much every war against Israel was started by Arab nations or Muslim majority nations. But every time Israel got funding from the U S and from West areas, and they took land away from Palestine. Um, they took Jerusalem eventually, which was originally an international city. They've taken over pretty much everything except for Gaza and the West Bank. And Palestine has, the Palestinians have largely focused on, they used to be focused on just getting rid of Israel. Now it's more focused on maintaining Gaza and the West Bank. But Israel's encouraging settlers to move to the West Bank. Um, Palestinian terrorist group Hamas has um, in attempts to try to stop Israel has done sort of the opposite and has bombed Palestinian citizens um, without really trying to focus on any real issue. And now Israel is building walls around their main areas, including Jerusalem. They're encouraging settlers to take over Muslim areas. Palestinian terrorists are fighting against Israel, and it's a messy conflict of which there's not really a clear solution at this point. And the issues over what to do are still talked about today. Um, I think I've had like two or three debates about Israel and Palestine at some point, or uh, no, um, two or three um, things about like extent at some point. It's one of those topics that comes up a lot. Brexit is actually another topic that comes up a lot, especially when you're doing Europe. Iran and Iraq. So I already mentioned the US coup. Um, uh, at some point in 1979, um, fundamentalists took over the government and established kind of a religious dictatorship. Um, Hold on. In U.S. foreign policy, it's well known because during Jimmy Carter's administration, um, members in the U.S. embassy were held hostage, and it's called the Iran hostage crisis. Um, one of the biggest problems is that Iran and Iraq are both Shia majority, and Shia and Sunni are two types of Muslim, two different factions of the Muslim religion that have basically never gotten along ever because of the religious differences. And Iran and Iraq have often like allied themselves because they're both Shia majority and they've had issues with Saudi Arabia, which is a Sunni led um, Wahhabist uh, nation. And the United States ever since the Iran hostage has pretty much hated Iran because Iran took US people prisoner and never really paid the price according to them. Um, Saddam Hussein was in Iraq for a while and he was a military leader. We fought two wars against him, the Gulf War and then the Iraq War after 9-11, which both of which we basically lied in order to get involved. Um, and we just did it to get oil. Uh, we tried to create a peaceful government, but again, the U.S. doesn't do that well. So now Iraq is very, very unstable. There are elections, but Iran has a lot of influence there and the United States has tried to keep Iran out, but they aren't really doing that. They're more just trying to keep their oil interests protected and they're both countries that are a little bit better off than like Afghanistan or Syria or Yemen, but also have problems. And Afghanistan. All right. So um, in 2001, uh, Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda uh, attacked um, the US Trade Center during 9-11 and America was very angry kind of naturally. And it was overwhelmingly voted that we fight a war against Al Qaeda to get rid of the Taliban and Al Qaeda within Afghanistan to kind of fundamentalist groups. Um, we were, we defeated the Pal Taliban basically. And we initially, it seemed like we were going to succeed, succeed in creating a democratic government, but the government failed. And then terrorism spoke, like spoke up again. Obama promised to commit to Afghanistan. He did drone strikes against civilians. He fought back and limited Al Qaeda and Taliban again. But then he began bombing Pakistan in order to get rid of the problems that were coming into Afghanistan. And that didn't really work. And now there's more terrorism. There's not really a stable government. There are regional conflicts. And basically after 20 years of war, the United States has solved nothing and it's only gotten worse. And the main reason is that we focused only on terrorism and there are actually domestic, regional, ethnic and international conflicts within the country. Um, Again, with all of these topics, if you are interested in any of them, I'm not giving you anywhere near the complete picture, kind of a brief outline. So look up other stuff if you're curious about this or anything, but that's kind of the summary of Afghanistan and if you ever hear about it. Africa, so I'm not gonna focus on any countries, I'm just gonna talk about how Africa has been screwed over by everybody else. 
So 422 million Africans live below, not the poverty line that we were talking about earlier, the $7, but I believe it's below the $2, or, um, $2 a day poverty threshold. So one in three Africans, um, more than 70% of the world's poorest people live in Africa. Um, poverty is not decreasing very quickly. It's like 1% decrease per year, which is nowhere near enough. 320 million people don't have access to clean drinking water. Only 43% have access to electricity. Um, some of the most in, unstable governments in, are in Africa, especially in West Africa with Nigeria and Burkina Faso, um, Congo. And basically what's happened is, is that the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Belgium, Germany, and now in the modern day, China in particular, have taken advantage of Africa's like natural resources in order to exploit Africa as a country, or not as a country, as a continent, and to keep the people kind of in poverty so that the only way they can really get money is if they give all their stuff to the United States as opposed to industrializing themselves. And so Africa is somewhat of a mess. Um, and famine and disease affect them far worse than most places. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa, you might have heard of, it killed, I think, I don't think it was in the millions, but it was tens of thousands of people. Um, locust famines in East Africa have starved people of crops. In South Africa, cities literally don't have any water, like major metropolitan areas like Johannesburg has run out of water at times. Um, 237 million Africans don't, are chronically malnourished. 20% of the population experiences hunger. I mean, you know, Africa has some of the worst conditions of anywhere in the world. And a lot of the funding they get from places like the United States and the United Kingdom are loans that they're expected to pay back very quickly, where they, the governments aren't able to fund them and they aren't able to develop industry and create their own products and encourage economy within there. And then, of course, malaria and respiratory diseases kill millions a year because they don't have as good medical cares in the West. And environmental degradation because one of the big things that Africa ships out is raw materials. Um, they have to take into their wildlife a lot. Um, I mean, they used to have, they have some of the biggest forests, some of the best national parks. I've been to Tanzania. It's absolutely beautiful, but poachers kill thousands of animals a day. Um, elephants and rhinos are literally disappearing because a poacher is trying to take the ivory and their um, horns. And Africa is kind of in this, in this tough conflict because on the one hand, their natural parks are beautiful and actually pretty good for their economy and are really important for keeping Africa, Africa. But on the other hand, they need some resources in order to develop their own industries and produce their own products so that Africa be could become self-sufficient. So there's kind of this dual problem. Let me see the time. All right, I'm gonna to try to hurry up a little. Okay, China. Um, China's, China's China. So first, China's not a communist or socialist country. Um, it's kind of, well, it's a combination of like sort of socialist and sort of capitalist. But basically the state owns the majority of all enterprises, but they still engage in a free market. So they are capitalist. So if you ever hear anybody say China's communist, that's wrong. At the most, they're part socialist and part capitalist, but moving on. Um, the picture on the right is Xi Jinping. And to give you an idea of his personality, um, a lot of people compared Xi Jinping to Winnie the Pooh and said that he looks like Winnie the Pooh, and that's a picture to prove it. And in response, he banned Winnie the Pooh from the entirety of China. Um, so he's a very authoritarian leader. He's repressed the press, the news, media. Um, and the Belt and Road Initiative is one of his policies. It's basically economic investments in all of the third world countries in Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia. And basically that he puts high interest rates on the loans. And so these countries are able to develop industries, but then they can't pay back the loans and China seizes the industries, making China's power expand all over the place. And it's really bad and corrupt leaders in other countries are taking all the money for themselves. Hong Kong is an island that um, had independence after Britain gave it independence, after Britain took the little area from China back in the 1800s. Um, and Hong Kong, the people in Hong Kong don't want to be part of China, but China has enforced more strict rules on them. The Hong Kong protests you may have heard about, they were all a response to China. Um, the South China Sea, what was that? Oh yeah, China's building island, literal islands in the middle of the South China Sea, which is kind of where Vietnam, Indonesia are. 
and they're building islands there in so order for them to claim the waterways as part of China so that they can control the trade down there. Um, and in addition, Japan and Korea have had trade conflicts and difficulties over how to deal with some of the exports since they ship a lot of the same stuff to the U.S. And China has been the mediator in a lot of those conflicts when the because Trump doesn't know what he's doing and hasn't gotten involved accurately. Um, so he's kind of increased influence in those areas. Uh, the Uyghur concentration camps, there's actually a John Oliver thing that just came out that's really good on that. He did something on Tibet. I mean, China's a pretty horrible place. Um, uh, Tibet is another example. They invaded Tibet back in the 50s. Um, in, they've massively repressed the rights of Uyghur Muslims and con put them in concentration camps. Um, in Tibet, they've repress the free rights of millions of people there. Um, they killed the Dalai Lama's successor, the Panchen Lama, I want to say. Uh, they've, um, and then with India, there are a bunch of border conflicts. So the problem is, is that China is not good and they haven't really done anything good for a very long time since way before the Cultural Revolution. Um, the problem is, is that if in recent surveys, 25% of the world says that the United States is the least trustworthy and is the biggest threat as opposed to China, which is basically the problem is just that even though China is bad, most people outside of the U.S. trust the U.S. way less. So the U.S. can't always actually do good things because more often than not, they're doing bad things in the third world, much like China. India, Pakistan, and Kashmir. Okay, so I'll go over this as quick as possible. Uh, 1948, Britain gave India and Pakistan the autonomy, like regional autonomy, and said that you can become your own countries. There were 400 and something territories and each chose to be part of Pakistan or part of India. For most of them, it was a pretty clear choice. Most of the Hindu ones joined India. Most of the Muslim regions joined Pakistan. There were some that had conflicts. There were two in the middle, Jammu and Kashmir, which were regions that were owned by princes. The princes were Hindu, but the nations themselves were Muslim. And there's conflict, the majority Muslim. So there's conflict over where to join. India and Pakistan both really wanted the regions. Um, uh, ultimately, the princes decided, hey, we'll go to India. But Pakistan said, no, the people want us. And then there was a war fought over it. And then since then, there's been massive conflict over what to do with Kashmir and Jammu. Um, Pakistan wants it. India wants it. The people of those regions generally just want regional autonomy and want to be their own country. But nobody's going to give that to them, uh, unfortunately. And since then, India and Pakistan have both built nuclear weapons to counter each other. And India recently under Narendra Modi um, basically annexed Kashmir and Jammu from Pakistan. And since then, they have um, stripped all, like, most internet service from Kashmiri citizens. They've repressed the political rights, and Kashmir and Jammu are both politically not politically, are both um, economically struggling, even though they have some of the best resources in the entire world. Um, so that's kind of the conflict. <clears throat> um, the United States has generally sided with India. Pakistan has generally received support from Russia and China. Um, and then, but there's no real like good side. Both sides have done a lot of bad things. And generally, Kashmir has just been struggling under both elements. <clears throat> um, so last thing, wars and conflicts in post-World War II Southeast Asia. Let me just check the time. Okay, so uh, the United States, France, and Britain have been involved in Southeast Asia quite a bit. The first Indochina war was the first war for Vietnam independence, where Vietnam got it from France. And they were split into two countries, North and South Vietnam. The North Vietnamese, led by Ho Chi Minh and sort of a communist-type group, um, said, no, we should be unified. And a lot of people in South Vietnam just um, agreed but the, um, France and the United States had put up a military dictatorship in South Korea uh, where some people actually did want to stay separate. And then that's what led to the Vietnam War, um, where the Americans were involved, where basically we spent 10 years trying to fight against v the Vietnam who were fighting for Vietnam. Uh, we argued that it was to counter communism, but it wasn't really had any, it didn't really have anything to do with communism, and we wasted our time and killed millions of troops. Uh, we pulled out. Vietnam became unified, and Vietnam has since then been sort of a semi-socialist state that has also became much more inviting to Americans because they want all of our tourist money. And in nearby Cambodia, 
there's a Cambodian civil war in which the Khmer Rouge, um, led by Pol Pot, installed a communist government that wasn't really communist and they just killed everybody. Uh, like quite literally, millions died in mass starvation programs. They were put into workers' camps. And ultimately, the people who liberated them were actually communist Vietnam who invaded, deposed of the Khmer Rouge and established a democratic country. Um, in Indonesia, it was initially a, I don't remember what kind of, I think it was a, just a social dump. It was like um, a Norwegian type government, uh, like at that level, like a Bernie Sanders level government in Indonesia. And the United States overthrew the government. Uh, they established a military dictatorship. <clears throat> um, uh, millions of people suffered. Now there's mass poverty, um, domestic threats. Um, incidentally, actually, um, one person who grew up not in the poor, poor areas, but actually in the rich areas in Indonesia for some time during this area was um, Barack Obama. He lived in Indonesia around the time that the military dictatorship was put up, and he was he lived in the military areas. Um, the U.S. puts down communism in Thailand. Uh, that happened for a very long time. There was a large communist presence in Thailand. They argued we should become a socialist state at bare minimum. And the United States funded groups against it, including drug cartels, which they did all over the place. They funded in Latin America, a lot of drug cartels to stop communism. Um, Malaysia too. Um, and then there's been a variety of other conflicts in Southeast Asia, mainly revolving over stopping communism for the US and then for terrorism and a variety of other bad government policies. And here's everything we didn't really go over. And this is not even the entirety of the list. Basically, the world is really complicated. And if you're ever interested in any of these things you see on there, you can look into them more. <clears throat> um, the problem is, is that, I mean, even though I've talked about a lot in this conversation, I didn't talk about anywhere near as much as I should. And since the United States really doesn't teach international relations that well, I mean, if you're going into 10th grade or, or younger than that, and you haven't had World Civ yet, you're going to learn some really good things in World Civ, but you'll miss out on a lot. You're not going to learn anywhere near the entirety of the stories. So I encourage you to always just read news articles about international affairs and issues and try to stay as politically active and not, ju not just in the United States, but also with issues all over the world, because not only does it make you <clears throat> just a better person in general, but it'll just make you more informed if you ever have to talk with people about a variety of issues and it allows you to if somebody ever argues for a really bad policy um like for some reason like they say the hong kong protests aren't good it gives you the ability to stand up for the right thing so i believe that that is oh that's my conclusion here we go yeah so basically complicated um you'll never be an expert unless you actually become a major in international affairs in college i'm not an expert by any means Luca's not, Connor's not, Alex isn't, nobody is. Um, ultimately, having understandings of some of the big issues are really important, as I already said. In speech and debate, it can be, if you, if you know the India-Kashmir conflict before you enter a round and you have that, the ability you'll be able to like, perform it in that debate is so much better than if you're learning about India and Kashmir for the first time 20 minutes before. So it's good to know, and it's just also good to know in real life. And so I believe that that